Awesome. Good afternoon. My name is Tori Billings. I'm a master's student here at Mines under the advising of Dr. Zahi Kaff. Um, I'm studying the biological treatment of oil and gas wastewaters um, using granular sludge. So today I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Gary Olson. Dr. Olson began his collegiate career studying physics of all things at the University of California, Los Angeles for his undergrad, grad, and master's studies. During his search for a worthy PhD program, he took a road trip to Wyoming and happened to stop through Denver on the way. This visit would be a life-changing one. Shortly after, he made the wise decision to switch to biophysics at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. When chatting with him last night, he described his switch from physics to biology as a no-brainer. He explained his future in biology as much more rewarding and interesting. During his PhD and postdoc studies, he had the opportunity to work with Norman Pace and Carl Woese. He describes this fortunate opportunity as being in the right place at the right time. Up to this point, Dr. Olson has completed many works on ribosomal RNA, including the database project that Norm spoke about yesterday. Other topics include biogenetic interference and the methanococcus genome. <clears throat> he currently works at the University of Illinois as a professor of microbiology. Please help me in welcoming him. Thank you all, and the organizers, it is indeed an honor to be here. Um, for the record, my PhD advisor is Mitch Sogan. Uh, the, uh, Norman was chairman on my committee and, and also postdoctoral advisor. Um, the, uh, that's the little story there. I remember distinctly that you wrote this. This happened in 1977. And you were a nice new graduate student, I think. And, and I was running the grad, I was running the seminar program. And you came around, yeah, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? And I had just gotten from Carl Woes, the preprint from 1977, legal name And so I, I asked you that preprint, and said, hey, why don't you talk about this? And you did a job off. Oh, yeah. And it's, I, I mean, uh, anyway, it was just so revelatory. And of course, I wanted to understand everything. So I'm sitting here trying to read this, uh, and, and and all of the methods and the you know, the, all of molecular phylogeny literature at that point in time was not all that hard to get through. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, but there were some absolutely spectacular papers that really helped shape my thinking and kept me on the on the line of. Not what is what are people doing, but what do I want to do? What is the question I want to answer? And using that along the way. By the way, yes, I am a professor of microbiology, and I just taught introductory microbiology for the first time. I have never had a microbiology class in my life. <laughs> um, the, uh, so, so what I want to talk about. Um, by the way, just one other thing that. Um, I mean, working with you know, Norman and, and Mitch Sogan and, and Carl Woese and stuff, one of the real joys about working with people like this is, you know, the, the, the classic statement, there is no such thing as a stupid question. Absolutely, there are stupid questions. But I could ask stupid questions and them not lose respect for me. <laughs> that mattered a lot. <laughs> um, okay. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today is a work in progress, um, and it, you know, again, with, with, with Norman Mitchell Sogan getting to know Carl Woese, I, of course, had a deep interest in translation, um, and there, the ideas on code on usage were just in their formative days, and I always had this feeling I would really would like to go back and look more carefully at code on usage, because, I mean, this is physically going on you know, at the center of translation, um, it, you know, the, the actual physical three-dimensional structures are influenced by this. And, and Michael Yaris' work, you know, as many or Michael Yaris was just mentioned. I mean, this was really, had a, I was completely convinced that there was a huge amount to be had by going and looking at it. But for 
25 years or something, 20 years, that got set aside. Um, I went on to start with the credits. Um, basically, all of the, the, the majority of this work is, is uh, due to two students, Jim Davis, Katie Carver. Yes, that's the same Katie Carver who's with Scott Dawson now. Um, and uh, so, so in outline, I'm going to talk a little about codon usages in a genome. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about recently acquired genes in Salmonella and use this to illustrate some of our tools. Um, something that uh, the, the uh, Jim and Katie noticed, um, which really changed a lot of my worldview. Um, and, and where we are now trying to understand the data. So the paper that triggered my, my getting back into this, um, I want, again, it was, I was looking for an excuse to do this. Um, and this paper, Evidence of Horizontal Gene Transfer in Escherichia coli Speciation, um, had this figure in it. <coughs> every plot symbol, you can think about this as a principal component analysis, every plot symbol is a gene. And they are separated by their codon usages. And this was published in 1991, before the complete genome was available. This is about 700 and some odd genes. And what the authors noticed was this kind of looked like a rabbit head to them. And they looked here, and these are typical everyday garden variety E. coli genes. And they looked over here, and they found ribosomal proteins, RNA polymerase, translation elongation factors. In short, abundant protein genes. This had been known since about 1981 that the, the abundant proteins had a distinctive codon usage. The literature says, yeah, well, this is clearly for rapid, accurate, efficient translation. Um, yeah, makes sense. Um, and you've got this sort of gradient of genes. Um, and then they look over here. And what do they find? You know, plasmid genes, prophage genes, uh, integrase, restriction modification. Um, and in short, a very large fraction of the genes there, they knew these are being horizontally transferred. They're mobile, mobile DNA. So they concluded that this is mobile DNA. Now, when I saw this, I didn't see this when the paper came out. I saw it as about three years later when uh, Paul Sharp presented this at a meeting. And it absolutely changed my worldview because my first thought was, those genes are transient. If you're going to see them, they have to be constantly replenished. So it's this is not, these are, the, the genes present now, and if you think over evolutionary times, genes are coming and going all of the time. This adds up to billions of genes going through this genome. The magnitude swamps the genome. I mean, it's, the amount of stuff that's come and gone is bigger than the genome itself. That took some convincing. Yeah, but it turns out every, every systematic error in those estimates just makes transfer bigger. Um, and in fact, as we got complete genome sequences, people recognized you could sequence two related genomes, same species, and microbiologically, we would all agree they really are the same species. They're in many fundamental properties quite similar. And yet, so for example, E. coli only 57H7 the 1,600 genes not present in the common laboratory K12. Um, when they did that sequence, they said, we'll see what's different in the genome, and we'll know what makes this so, so terribly pathogenic. And they had way too much material to, to look through. Um, the flip side is K12 has 600 genes not in L157H7. This is a third of the genome, and it's the same species. And mostly, we don't know what they do. Um, the, uh, um, <coughs> now, one of the things, these are not pseudogenes. Um, I mean, 
And some of them clearly are, but most clearly aren't. Um, so they must be occasionally useful. Okay, otherwise they, they would accumulate mutations, they would decay. Um, the flip side is they can't be useful very often. Otherwise they'd be in all the members of the species. Okay? If you're if you're useful once a year, if you're useful once every hundred years, you'll be in every member of the species. Um, and so the other realization is, of course, again, this is evidence of uh, the flux of genes, the coming and going of genes. One of the things that is generally left vague in the literature is where are they coming from? Now, the pan genome literature, which is later than this, we're going to flip back to, um, kind of implicitly says they are members of the species genome. It is a species pan genome. I'm going to suggest that's not true. Um, this was kind of dogma at the time. Uh, at the time of the introduction, horizontally transferred genes have the base composition and codon usage pattern of the donor genome. Makes sense. But because transfer genes are subject to the, the mutational processes affecting the recipient genome, the acquired uh, sequences will incur substitutions and eventually come to be reflected in a composition of the recipient genome. Makes total sense. And in fact, there's a lot of good data. This happens. Okay. Um, the, the most common fate of a, an acquired gene is, in fact, it will be deleted later. The second most common fate is you drift to match your recipient. Um, okay. So, our idea was why don't we go find the codon usage of the donor? So, who has that codon usage as their normal codon usage? That should be the donor. Okay, well, easier said than done. We had to develop a database of codon usages of all the genomes. Um, and so given a plot like this, actually we don't work from the plot, we work from the actual codon usage of every individual gene. This is just a projection to look at multi-dimensional data. My 59-dimensional projection system is not working today. <laughs> um, this is actually Salmonella type of Marie and LT2. It looks just like E. coli. So one other thing I want to point out, just, you know, it hasn't sunk into the community. Okay, here's the rabbit head. On this diagram, this is the high expression genes. This is the alien genes. The alien here. Now, principal compound, and now this is the first principal compound. The most variation in codon usage is due to the alien genes, not due to the selection for high expression uh, abundant proteins. Um, you never noticed anything. Point that out before. Um, looking at Salmonella and E. coli gave us a huge advantage. We've got to ask, what are the core genes? What are the genes that are not coming and going? What are the things that have been here, in fact, since the common ancestry of E. coli and salmonella? It's about 2,000 genes, and here they are. Okay, so in yellow, these are, we believe, vertically inherited since the origin of salmonella and E. coli, and I want a computer to interpret these genes and tell me what's typical codon usage for the genome, and tell us what's high expression codon usage. And anything that doesn't look like, like a normal gene will call us a potentially alien gene. Okay, that was the video. Um, okay, this is the most common codon usage in that gene set. Most common defined as the largest number of genes not significantly different. What's interesting is this is, in essence, it's a definition of a mode. Um, mode is actually defined in one dimension and is, in fact, susceptible to changes in coordinate system. We accidentally invented mode in an arbitrarily large number of dimensions, and in fact, it doesn't depend on the coordinate system because it's defined by a statistical significance measure. Okay. Um, so that is the modal codon usage of the uh, Salmonella. Okay, what about high expression? What we did is we took E. coli genes with high expression codon usage, and we simply project 
what's the corresponding gene in salmonella or any other bacteria? Okay. We have a similar set for archaea. And in fact, so the software works for either. Um, and, and so this is um, the mode of salmonella genes that look like E. coli abundant proteins. Um, OK, we can combine those. Now, that's two point estimates. This is really a continuum. So we need a 59 dimensional line starting here and continuing on up there. OK, that was five years or so of work. Um, <laughs> I was about 10 years from the actual original attempt at doing it and just get simply getting overwhelmed both uh, mathematically and computationally. Um, and so, well, again, in doing comparative analysis, these, the blue genes, the cyan genes, are the genes in Salmonella, Enterica, Typhimurium, LT2, that are not in any other Salmonella or E. coli that we looked at. And if you think about that, that means they're recently acquired. It's a really clean gene set. We don't often have this luxury of having, you know, the good genome sampling of diverse genomes. But here, for the medical, you know, microbiology, they did it. So, we can do the same trick. Here's the modal codon usage of the most recently acquired genes. And, you know, once you start doing a trick, you can say, well, here's typical genes, and here's the axis of alienness. Um, yeah, we, we, we don't know what to call it because, in fact, it's not alienness, it's something else. Okay? That's what we thought it was. Okay, so we can put it all together, and now we can describe a gene in terms of how much does, you know, what is its projection on this axis that represents expression level? What is its, its projection on this axis of alienness? Or does it just simply look like something else? And notice I have changed that there's a color gradient here and a color gradient there, which actually just helps in visualizing things that we'll come to later. Okay. So we have automated methods. We crank through the genomes, and we build a database of over 900 genome codon usages. We take, in this case, it was actually the E. coli alien-looking genes and said, who do they look like? The answer was no one. They didn't look like the normal genes of any of those 900 genomes. And to this day, they don't look like the normal genes of any other genome. And uh, that was depressing. <laughs> uh, so a few days later, Jim and Katie come into my office and say, well, actually, they do look like something else. They look like the non-native genes of Salmonella, because this is the E. coli genes. I go, what kind of genes? That's, you know, E. coli, Salmonella, they're very closely related. Of course, they have, you know, all of the codon usages are going to look very similar. And then they said, no, actually, the alien genes, the non-native genes, look more similar than the vertically inherited genes. So these things supposedly being pulled out of the universe of available horizontal transfer DNA are more similar in their codon usage than are the carefully vertically inherited, selected, maintained genes. Um, <laughs> Um, and, and, you know, well, we, we approved our analysis. We looked for every possible artifact we could look for. The data got really, really good. That's E. coli mode. That's salmonella mode. That's E. coli alien mode, recently acquired mode. That's salmonella recently acquired mode. And although this is a projection from 59 dimensions to two dimensions, they really are close. It's not just the projection. They are three times closer and three times closer in a space with 42 degrees of freedom is really hard to do, okay? Um, 
and, and you know, you can see in a, in a tree of codon usage, these are more similar than are the core genes of the same genomes. Um, okay. So how did they become similar? And again, this is an insane amount of trying to come up with hypotheses, see what people are saying in the literature. Most of what's in the literature is speculation and it's completely untestable. It's mostly circular. Um, the, uh, that it's never defined well enough to be testable, but we gave it good faith tries anyway. And the only thing that really kept coming back is they will have the same codon usage if they came from the same place. I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, and, okay, so, um, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's really embarrassing, but yeah, we, we haven't found a way out of it. Um, anybody who can offer us a better solution that actually fits the data and is testable, we'd be happy to listen to it. But. Um, okay, so if they come from the same place, um, they uh, where? Um, and again, if you don't find it any place else, and not for lack of trying, um, then they have to be their own reservoir. Okay, so E. coli and salmonella are getting it from E. coli and salmonella. Um, and you have Klebsiella and a couple of other closely related bacteria. Um, this gave us then a problem. Okay, we know they're recently acquired. We believe they are coming from the same closely related species. Then why is their codon usage peculiar? And the only thing we knew is that these were recently horizontally transferred. So we figure we're going to rationalize the data and say, you know, well, it's because they're horizontally transferred. Now we we've said we have no mechanism to, to base that upon. Nothing biologically described would impose a codon usage uh, bias just because you're horizontally transferred. But that didn't stand in our way of that, you know, that being our hypothesis. Um, so, so red flag number one, we've got, you know, really unexplained data. Um, and so we can go back to our two, we can take any individual gene, and as I say, we can project it. Yeah, where is it on the expression axis? Where is it on the alienness axis? And we can color the gene by the projection locations. And what we're going to do is, if you're a lousy projection, um, we're going to darken the background. Okay, so so something just looks doesn't match that at all. We go into a dark background. So here's you know just a cluster of uh, cell wall and cell division genes, um, and these are coming out in the green, which was the genome modal codon usage. They look like just typical genes, except for FTSZ, which looks like a high expression gene. Okay. Um, yeah, here's some ribosomal protein clusters and a couple of other, you know, genes in here, cold shock protein, uh, ribonucleotide, uh, um, polyrhythm, ribonucleotide, nucleotide of transferase. These all look like abundant proteins. Some of these get quite dark backgrounds on the alien axis saying these, these do not look like those alien genes at all. Um, and as I say, most of them are fairly good projections onto the, uh, what's the uh, typical protein, what's the abundance. Acquired genes, cobalamin biosynthesis, um, we believe was a, uh, acquired long ago by salmonella, by the way, I'm showing you salmonella genes. Um, and these look like everyday, happy, healthy salmonella genes. Um, <coughs> propane diol utilization, basically the same idea, unless you look at the uh, regulatory protein, which looks fairly in. Now, uh, pathogenicity island one, okay? Basically, everything looks like it's out there on the alien axis. Okay? Um, most of them are an okay match to typically you know, salmonella gene, except for a few of them. By the way, I, you know, I know it's hard to read, and this is why the color coding. Um, you can see the darker backgrounds. Um, they're not, many of these are just not 
consistent with being an everyday happy, healthy salmonella gene. Uh, more pathogenicity island one, pathogenicity island two, you know, you get the theme, three and four and five look like that. Uh, tetrathionate respiration um, is sometimes described as part of pathogenicity island one, but it looks like a typical native gene. Now, um, Fels prophage looks typical alien genes. The other, another category that comes up again and again and again, if it looks like a surface-like oscillation, um, it's often going to look alien. Um, the, uh, okay. So recently acquired genes have a peculiar codon usage. That's how we define the codon usage. Okay. Then we went back and said whether well, genes had this codon usage. Um, but uh, yeah, as I say, we couldn't explain why they have a peculiar genome uh, codon usage if they're just being passed around amongst enteric genomes. Um, more anciently, most anciently acquired genes have ameliorated to look like the host, but some continue to look alien even tens of millions of years later. Um, so, um, so, so this changes our point of view. If, if transfer isn't necessary, then it's, it's something else. This codon usage is useful to these organisms. Why? These genes. And, you know, well, high expression genes, it's for high, abundant, you know, protein production. What is it for these genes that makes them have a preferred codon usage? Um, where we've ended up is leaning towards stressful conditions. Um, we continue to somewhat use this term um, because, you know, starvation is what we find ourselves coming back to again and again. But even starvation is a vague term. Um, a very cool data set that Katie Carver ran across is these are um, stringent response changes in gene expression. Okay, so we have, uh, I mean, it, it, you've knocked out PPGPP production, you apply it or not, and compare gene expression. When we learn about stringent response, we learn about this is a response to amino acid starvation, and we learn about all of the processes that get shut down. These are these big blue balls. These are genes shut down at least tenfold. I mean, they're really changing expression. On the other hand, the genes nobody talks about are the ones that are increased in expression under stringent response. And for the most part, they look like they have the alien or the stress response or whatever it is, code on usage. Um, now, the uh, this is uh, the data under early stationary phase. Actually, if you look at state, late stationary phase, do the same experiment. Interestingly, the genes turned up is actually largely a different set of genes, but they also have this codon usage. So this is the closest thing that we have um, to suggestion that this really is a starvation. It is a codon usage that is useful under starvation. <laughs> Um, so, um, so what do we, um, actually maybe I'm going to start down here. Um, so the first thing we ran across was that, uh, you know, the whole pan genome concept was you've got genes coming and going within a species and, um, what surprised us is, it's, they may be coming and going within a species, but they're coming from not just that species, but other closely related species. It's happening often enough to give them the same, the same codon usage. It's actually the plurality codon usage. Um, the, uh, um, we have tried to look at the literature on starvation codon usage. To the best of my knowledge, there is no published microarray experiment that is actually on starvation. 
I mean, real starvation. Um, now everybody goes, oh yes, there's lots of papers on stationary phase, which there are. That's not necessarily starvation. I mean, in fact, a lot of stationary phase, those cells are not starving. I mean, they're in a different cellular state, but they are not, they have not depleted all their nutrients. Um, the, uh, um, there are predictions that um, if you are depleted of an amino acid, you don't want to compete with the messages for the abundant proteins. And in fact, the abundant proteins will be sucking up specific charged tRNAs, and you don't want to be using those tRNAs. Um, the data on that is all one amino acid at a time. Um, it's a very limited set of data, and there's some extrapolations and interpolations. And I could pick through, I mean, in general terms, their predicted pattern at some level matches our predicted pattern, or our you know, pattern of codon usage observed in these genes. Um, but there are clearly differences in detail. Um, but uh, it's, it's, again, it, I would say it's largely consistent with our the possibility that what we're seeing is a starvation codon usage. Um, we are trying to come up with, with how do you test a hypothesis like this? Um, you, you can't just go in and muck around and say, I will create the same gene with two different codon usages, because we're not that good at figuring out what's a good codon usage. Talk to anybody in biotech. If you want to express a gene, you try several different constructs, because some of them just don't work for unexplained reasons. Um, so uh, as I say, um, we are interested in what are the what would we predict, for example, if in one species there are two different tRNAs for a pair of codons that in a second species it's a single tRNA for the same two codons, what would we predict in terms of shifts, relative shifts in the codon usage? Um, we have not thought that through, but one of the things I can say is even in E. coli, when it's a single tRNA for two different codons, the relative use of those two codons shifts. And that is not consistent with the tRNA charging level argument. Maybe it's consistent with other arguments. But, so I leave you with uh, the, the, the questions that we would love to answer. Thank you. I'm embarrassed to admit we have not systematically looked at that. Um, it's an obvious thing to do. All of our analyses are controlled for amino acid composition. Because if you don't do it, and you know, like membrane proteins stick out like a sore thumb. So I'm thinking something like you know, tryptophan that is really hard to synthesize. You know, under starvation conditions. It, my recollection is there's no big there's no wild change in that particular I mean I, I, I glanced at it. It's a wonderful question, and I'm embarrassed to admit I haven't looked at it. By the way, we see this almost everywhere we look in nature. Look in nature. Even though their, their basal codon usages can be wildly different, um, they have a high expression codon usage and a something else codon usage. Yes? So why do you not like the all the transfer DNA has come through the same process, which has a bias for DNA structure, let's say. Because it might, might have shifted codon usage uh, correspondingly. Yeah, so, so the control experiment that we have not done is correct for oligonucleotide composition and see, you know, is this a reflect? I mean, because that, that is where you would expect a structural component. The, the, the structural pattern, per se, has no knowledge of strand or, uh, or phasing in translation. And we have not gone through. Um, it doesn't really look like it, and we still don't know any such mechanism. So one can, one can imagine 
all kinds of things. And the last thing, of course, is these, uh, the, these islands and stuff. So yes, my first argument was, well, maybe there's cryptic transfer. We looked really hard. I mean, we pushed that hypothesis beyond the breaking point before we gave in and said, you know, it just doesn't work. I, feel, I mean, if I like that, I'm forced to predict the transfer genes that make our for example. We have to yeah. suffer the same bias. Have you ever made that kind of that Yeah, no, and, and actually, you know, believe it or not, I have not, um, I have, I've not pulled out the intergenic regions and systematically looked at them because um, I would, you know, I have not looked at that either for composition, I mean, even base composition. And people do argue, I mean, these, these islands, these are, you know, the classic low G plus C islands, but it's actually only a few percent change, five percent change roughly. Um, and and um, the, the effects we're seeing are much, much larger than that. And furthermore, we could do matched sets. We could take transferred and core genes matched in G plus C content and everything we saw held up. Um, so, yeah. Is it mostly mucosal microbes that E. coli is exchanging DNA with? Is that actually might suggest where the exchange occurs? So we have carefully gone through the databases of microbiome organisms. Um, the, there's absolutely no evidence that any of them have this alien codon usage except for the alien codon usage of the related microbes. Um, this is a common argument that uh, you're going to be exchanging genes with the, the you know, neighbors you're snuggled up against. There's, what, one of the things that has been demonstrated by everything from broad host range plasmids Almost, almost any conjugation system will transfer DNA over staggering phylogenetic distances. Um, and it's not the attempt rate. These, the, the, the injection of DNA has got to be going on all the time. It's what takes. And I could bring up one other factor. None of these drag along with them a housekeeping gene. They, you don't find an adjacent typical core gene ever in thousands of cases we've looked at. So it's not random pieces. And, and frankly, it's as though they're just you know, punctuated by you know, some, you know, transposes, it's you know, recognition sites. Um, that would be consistent with everything we see. And then the question is, is it the endogenous transposases that define which DNA successfully gets integrated? Non you know, not, yeah, non-site specifically into your chromosome. Yes? So there are definitely hard examples where you can look at organ transfer genes and find something very similar in the other genome. Correct. Right, so do you see some oh, look, of those? Oh, very similar. So do you see some of those? So, so I mean, think actually, I've actually published some things where it's been like a smoking gun, this gene. Yeah, from absolutely. Um, and, and actually, it's much, much rarer. It's orders of magnitude rarer than the effect we are looking at. Um, uh, but yes, you see it. And so, for example, a prophage, you can find, you know, a salmonella prophage, you know, prophage in an E. coli strain as an integrated prophage. Um, or actually, I'm not sure it's E. coli, but an Escherichia species as an integrated prophage. Um, so we found some metabolic genes that happens. Work where you can see. Absolutely. Clear. The mass so in essence, few of any of these out of five thousand E. coli and seventeen hundred salmonella genes that we looked at um, have that property. We know that happens, we see it, and we see the long term consequences of it. I mean we you know, there 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 is a randomization of a lot of very uh, I mean, one of my favorites was the amino acyl DNA synthetases. Um, you know, the recipient in principle had one. Why did it need another? Um, but it happens. Um, and, and this is absolutely going on. But the take rate on that, I mean, we're talking here, seeing 
Yeah, or yeah, 2,000 gene differences between two E. coli strains. The, ma the magnitude of this is, is, is overwhelming. And it's much greater than the magnitude of, at least in these species, much greater than the uh, homologous recombination rate. Um, I have heard reports that, uh, I think the Vibrio, their evidence is that the homologous recombination rate uh, dominates. Thank you very much, Gary.